You're listening to Halfway There, episode number 159, Joe, Ilida, and Finding the Peace of God. Hey, my friends, welcome to another episode of Halfway There. This is the show, of course, where we have honest conversations with ordinary Christians about today's Christian experience. As always, I am your host, Eric Nevins. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, This conversation today, I can't wait to tell you about it. I think it's really relevant to where we are, and I I know that you'll just uh, be amazed by what God does as you you listen. Before we get to that, though, I want to share with you uh, just one thing. I've uh, been working on the next eight-day experience. What's eight-day experience? Well, it's my uh, small daily devotional for you. Uh, you can pick one up at my website, which is ericnevins.com, or just go to halfwaytherepodcast.com. Hit eight-day experience in the menu. Um, eight-day experience is a short Bible study that you can do in about 15 minutes a day. You can do it eight days in a row, or if you want to, one day a week for two months. It doesn't matter. You're going to get the same thing out of it. In fact, I think if you are busy, you don't have a lot of time, uh, this Bible study is one that you can do that doesn't uh, require you to get to cram the reading right before a, a group meeting or something, right? Um, I've been there. Believe me. You can just jump into it uh, when you have time, whether it's every few days, once a week, whatever. You'll actually get a lot from that because you're going to tuck that passage of scripture in your mind and start thinking about it and meditating on it, which is really the goal. So uh, if you want to pick that up, it's real easy. Like I said, just go to ericnevins.com, click on eight day experience or halfway there podcast.com click on uh, eight day experience and you can pick up the first one. It's all, it's all on um, Mark one 40 through 45 Jesus experience with a leper uh, really astounding story. I had to really wrestle with what are the implications for this story and my own relationship with Jesus. I'd love to invite you into that as well. So please feel free to do so. Okay. So here's the next, uh, the, here's, here's our conversation. So I'm speaking with Joe Alita and Joe is, uh, he's an IT guy, but he has struggled with mental illness and he's very open about how that, uh, has gone down for him. In fact, even having um, feelings of suicide and um, or suicidal thoughts, I guess, and even hurting, wanting to hurt others. Uh, we talk about that a little bit, which is, um, you know, a sensitive topic for me uh, at the moment with, I mean, it always is, but with uh, what happened at my kid's school a few months ago, um, you know, it's, it's something I think it's, we're, we're all thinking about. Um, I didn't get this out in time for National Suicide Prevention Week uh, a couple weeks ago, but that's okay. Uh, if you are in a place where you are struggling with mental health, with suicidal thoughts, just know that there's help for you. You're not alone. So if God can work in Joseph's life, he can work in your life. Uh, reach out, uh, whether it's a suicide prevention line or a, you know, I don't know any whatever whatever this is a, a trusted friend, a pastor, uh, somebody, uh, a parent or a family member, uh, whoever. It's just really important that you be honest about where you are, um, because that's the only way we only heal in community. So I wanted to just uh, throw that out there as an encouragement at the beginning. Here, uh, it is it is a difficult topic, but you're gonna we're gonna talk about it uh, through Joe's story today. So friends, I hope otherwise that you are well and that this story really uh, encourages you to see how God is faithful even when we feel uh, like things are falling apart. Okay. So here's the conversation with Joe Alida. It's called uh, Joe Alida and Finding the Peace of God. Joseph, welcome to the Halfway There. Thank you. Thank you for having me on here. I'm glad to uh, to just do it. So let's start out. Tell us just a little bit about who you are and what you're doing right now. Uh, right now, I do uh, a radio show, a local radio show. Um, I also broadcast that on Facebook. 
uh, via Facebook. It's called Touchy Subject Radio on Facebook, and uh, that's what I'm doing now. And I'm learning more about uh, cinematography and all this type of stuff at uh, at the meet local media center here. Um, and so I've been putting a lot of my time and energy um, into one of my first loves, which is media. So that's Very why cool. I'm doing this, um, and also just uh, doing a lot of street street outreach ministry. Oh, very cool. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Um, well, I guess we'll have to talk about that. I saw a guy, we went to go see Hillsong United a couple of weeks ago and there was a guy out there preaching and I thought, uh Oh, that's, that's not, <laughs> we'll have to talk about that. Uh, okay. So There's different varieties. there are different varieties and he was definitely a different variety. So anyway, all I want to do is good talk to him, but that's neither here nor there. So, uh, let's talk about, about that. Uh, you, you love media. Like why, what, tell me, tell me what you love about that, and kind of where that comes from. Well, it's it's story. It's the the powerful uh, medium of storytelling. Yeah. Um, that I really love, and ever since I was a youth, um, I've always been attracted to the movies, television, um, you know, sci-fi, all the way to nonfiction and documentaries. It's just something I've always loved. Um, just the ability to. Uh, portray a story and, and get an idea across in a creative way. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I think that uh, stories are powerful. That's why we do them here. That's why we, we do that. I found out uh, pretty quickly that uh, I'm pretty bad at telling people what to think, but uh, I'm really good at asking the question <laughs> and listening. So uh, I agree with you yeah. about the power of stories and that actually helps it helps us assimilate information way better. And we're starting to, starting to going to be a bigger issue in education and uh, maybe someday in the 50 years, it'll be true in the church too. So uh, that's, sorry, that's a little bit of cynicism there. So I want to ask you uh, some questions. Let's go back in your story and hear kind of how God has brought you up to this point. So uh, what was it like growing up? You're, you told me you're in Boston. So what, uh, like what, did you grow up there or is that, uh, did you end up there? Yeah, born and raised, born and raised yeah. in Boston, um, in a in a city. It's it's a good sized city. Uh, it's grown since uh, I've been a kid, but it's right outside of Charlestown. If you're familiar with uh, American Revolutionary history, um, so it's a big historical town, and also the North End, where a lot of my family, uh, you know, had business, and so most of, a majority of my time was spent in the uh, the Italian section of the North End, which is like our little Italy. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah, Boston is such a cool um, historical site. If you guys have never been there, you should totally go. It's it's definitely interesting. I kind of knew the answer to that already because you've got that you've got the Boston accent just just enough to, <laughs> to be able to tell, right? Yeah, uh, which is great. Um, yeah, no, you can't, and that's great though. It's good. I love Boston. I told you I've been to Boston a couple times, and uh, the history and the just the just the old the fact that it's old is is really cool what was the spiritual climate like so because typically those of us who grew up in the midwest think of the northeast as being very spiritually dead and there's nothing going on there so what was that like for you uh for me it's very catholic um ah. so uh irish catholic italian catholic uh, roman catholic um so a majority of my friends growing up were catholic um so i mean that's sort of the environment I was when I was younger. Um, as I grew older, I started meeting people of you know, different ethnicities and different uh, b- backgrounds and beliefs. Um, and I sort of, my family stumbled into Pentecostalism. Um, so there's actually the church that I was, I ended up being raised under um, was actually an Italian speaking, also slash African um speaking church. So, which was, I I grew up in a really diverse climate here. Um, So the idea that it's spiritually dead is not entirely accurate, but it it, it is very secular because of Harvard and because of MIT and a lot of those secular institutions, which were previously Bible college, uh, Bible colleges back in the day. But um, it was really a mix. That's, that's what I got. Like the older I got is the more diverse I got but I was very protected when I was younger. Right. Okay. So you grew up in in kind of a diverse background and definitely probably more unique than, you know, I grew up in like a very homogenous 
state, right? So a very, very different kind of world. How did that affect you spiritually? Did you grow up going to church or like you said, you were kind of Catholic. So was that like, did you, were yeah. you, you just went to church on Christmas and Easter or you went every week or what? Yeah. My, my father really wasn't religious. My grandmother was more religious. She was very, my father's mother was very religious. So she lived right across from the Catholic church. And so, you know, she had forced me to to go to CCD, Catholic uh, Catechism uh, Education. And he uh, was sort of responsible for me being interested in, in religion. She taught me how to pray, you know, before bed and things like that. Uh, but as far as the rest of my family, my grandfather, who I was very close to, uh, because my family owned this property that I live in now, uh, we owned a several couple properties in the city, and we're very tight knit. Uh, so I spent a lot of time with my grandmother, uh, my grandmother, my grandfather on my mother's side, um, who were very, very secular. My grandfather, especially, who was atheist, agnostic. Wow. Okay. So you had a really mixed background. So how did for you did you start to find Christ? Uh, personally, it was around the time of fifteen um, when. I started getting very spiritual as far as, uh, you know, Eastern religions and things like that of different, different, uh, religions that I was exploring, whether it was Buddhism, whether it was Hinduism, whether it was, um, all types of things. And I was an atheist at that point, um, because my cousin and my grandfather, they had convinced me that there was a God. Well, that's Um, interesting. So why did you go searching religions if you were an atheist? I had a lot of trouble growing up. It was just a lot, a lot of trouble, and uh, I needed something outside of myself um, because the world at that point when I was a teenager was very, very black. I had a great childhood. I had a very, very close childhood with my family, and uh, but as soon as I started getting into the world, as soon as I started meeting the world, it got very, very difficult really quick. Gotcha. Yeah, well, I think that's that can certainly be the case, right? That that makes sense. So take us into that story. Like, how did that? You're, so you're looking for religion. You're looking at all these different religions. Uh, my grandfather was very into science. Like he taught me everything about the Big Bang, and um, he was also kind of he was a very he was sort of a sci-fi type kind of guy. So you know, aliens and documentaries about that. So that sort of introduced me to a pseudo spirituality, mm. if you could say. Um, but the the time in my life was when I started getting in trouble in school, started getting into fights at school. Uh, and those those fights weren't really warranted. I didn't want to fight with people. I wasn't an aggressive person. I was actually kind of a skinny guy um, before. And now, you know, I'm kind of filled out now. But <laughs> I was a skinny guy and I was getting beat up. So, and I was at, for some reason, I was getting blamed for the fights that I was in and I was just going from school to school. Uh, I had some friends. I had, I had, uh, you know, a diverse crowd of friends, but still I was always getting in trouble somehow. Um, and that sort of made me wonder, like, is this world really just like, I was looking for justice, Mm. you know, where is justice? Yeah. Okay. So you're asked, so you're looking for justice and which I guess that makes sense if you're fighting, right? Like maybe you're kind of standing up for yourself and you're maybe wondering who's standing up for me. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Totally. Okay. So, so you're doing that. And then what, what happened? And so as, as I get further and further, I just started more, my mental stability started failing more and more. The more I got into all of these practices that I thought were very spiritual. You know, I wanted to, I aspired to, you know, get into uh, astral projection and things like this. Um, And I know a lot of people now who have gotten out of that and become very uh, religious and spiritual, like in a a true sense, in our Christianity sense. But it was just a start for me. And the more that I got into those practices is the more that my mental stability was starting to Mm. unravel. And the, you know, my psychiatrist at the time, and as they assigned me a psychiatrist, I just started feeding into some of the questions they were asking me. Some of them meant well. Some of them were just really into just giving me medication. Uh, and I rejected that. I didn't want to be medicated. Um, and so I just started acting out more. 
just started acting up more bizarrely, talking about conspiracy theories and all this type of just whatever was out there, whatever was, you know, music that I was listening to, death metal, uh, all, whatever I could do, movies, what horror movies, all types of things, whatever I could do to express whatever pain was going on inside me, mm. I would do it to freak people out. Sort of like how David and Saul, like he pretended like he was crazy and insane to get people away from him, if that's how you can interpret it. Yeah. But that was sort of my mindset. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So how did that play itself out? Um, more and more psychiatry, more and more medication, uh, more and more schools until I finally moved in with my father uh, in New Hampshire because my, my parents at this point were split up. They had divorced when I was one, actually. So it was kind of quite normal. Being, uh, being in a divorced family was kind of normal, but I still resented it. And my mm. father was kind of a pessimistic dude, and he still is, but he's chilled out more. Um, post heart attack, he sort of had to chill out. Wow. But back then, he was a very aggressive guy. Okay. So you're going on this. It's getting worse and worse, more and more treatment, but not really helping. Right. It's just, it's spiraling. It's really, really spiraling, spiraling out of control. Um, I'm spiraling out of control. I'm talking suicidal. Um, wow. I'm very angry at the system. I'm very angry at the world. I'm very angry at myself. Um, and I see myself as, as a, and people have told me, I, you know, at that time, I had a lot of potential. I'm a very intelligent guy. I'm always reading books. Uh, I want to be a scientist. I want to be a computer scientist. I still kind of do, um, you know, as I've done IT for the last couple of years. But, um, you know, the thing is, I, I had a lot of potential, but the the mental stability was was so out of control that I, I had no confidence to become what I, what I wanted to be. Yeah. So you're really struggling with mental health here. Yeah. Like, yeah. That and that's that's. Uh, I think that's a hard thing because. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we wanted to talk because uh, mental health is really a big deal. Like, like, right, obviously, but uh, right now I think we're just starting, particularly in the church to understand how important mental health is. It's not as easy as just saying, uh, you know, follow Jesus and read your Bible and pray. Right. It's sometimes there's other things going on and you had a lot going on. So this eventually climaxes for you in one event, right? Do you want to tell us that story? Yep. So this is sort of the, the pivot point um, of how I went from pseudo spirituality, in my words, to uh, to becoming a real Christian um, and how that stage was set. So I'm um, in New Hampshire with my father. He had just remarried uh, my stepmother and she had just moved in. And I was in um, I was in middle school. Uh, I was just about to go into, into high school. The year before that, um, and I had met some new friends, uh, and some of these friends, because I was in special school, of course, they had a lot of these same mental issues as I did, a lot of these emotional issues and broken family issues and all types of stuff. Um, my family, my father thought it would be better if I lived with him, so that would I would be under his authority, um, his discipline, um, and so we said, let's give it a try. Uh, I had was sitting one day in, in class and uh, just to set the picture, this, this particular school, there were rumors going around that there was abuse going on with these teachers. Wow. Yeah. There was all sorts of abuses and neglect was a huge one because they really weren't teaching us anything. Uh, and me being, you know, like an A student, you know, academically, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to evolve somehow. <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to make something of myself and uh, it did nothing for me to just sit there and watch Star, Star Wars all day. Yeah. Uh, as much as that's a cool movie. <laughs> right. So we're sitting there, we're bored and we're talking about all the abuse rumors, um, whether or not they're true. I'm not completely sure, but I did hear that there was an incident with, particular teacher and a friend of mine. Um, it was a female friend of mine. I'm not going to go into detail of where and how, but um, the whole incident just made me upset that we would just be sitting in a cesspool of nothingness 
not learning anything and just being bossed around by teachers who weren't doing anything for us. So, you know, we're sitting around and this is a huge lesson in, in James, in the book of James, when it says, keep your mouth, keep your, keep your tongue from evil. Yeah. Uh, so my first lesson as, as a person, as my family is starting to preach Christianity to me, um, I'm still an atheist at this point, but I'm starting to think well, about the gospel. Well, why were they doing that? Why were they doing that? Why were they preaching to me? Because, well, first of all, my mother had started to, uh, my mother had started to believe. My uncle had started to believe. Uh, my aunts were the ones who were really evangelizing the whole family. My grandmother's mm-hmm. brothers, uh, sisters, uh, if that's not too confusing, they're <laughs> actually twins, um, identical twins, and they, and they were evangelizing the family. So it was spreading throughout Protestant Christianity, uh, Pentecostal, Pentecostalism was spreading throughout my family. Gotcha. Okay. And, yeah. All right. So you're starting to explore. Go ahead. Yeah. So I'm starting to explore Christianity at that point. And even a barber um, across from my uncle, his store in the North End was starting to tell me about Christianity. And I wasn't exactly there yet. But the anger was still there within me. The hurt and the pain of not receiving the help that I needed from the psychiatry, from the the teachers around me. I'm sitting there with my friends and a friend of mine was talking about having a shotgun. And we were Boy Scouts at the time. We had just done this class where we were learning how to shoot. And so he tells me, you know, just whispers over to me, you know, I got a shotgun. I can give you one. I can can sell you one. Um, Or, I, you know, we can meet up tomorrow and I can give you one. And I says, I probably was jokingly, or I probably was half serious. I'm not exactly sure what I would have done or how things would have played out um, if I had agreed to take his shotgun or take his gun. Um, but he told me that he would give me one and that would solve some problems. And a teacher had overheard me say, uh, you know, just the discussion that we were having. Um and so I was immediately taken to the police station. Um, I was taken to court uh, very quickly. Wow. And um, all I received was anger management at that time, but it was an outpatient for several months uh, for anger management. But the following year, I was just off the wall threatening people. Um, I didn't learn my lesson from that situation. Mm. And I kept lashing out at people. I was threatening other students. And at that point I was um, given four months in a, in a, in a rehabilitation center in a mental health facility where it was just me and my Bible. And that's where I really started getting spiritual. Wow. Okay. Well, that's amazing. So when was that? That was about, um, I was, that was my first in the mental institution. That was my first year of high school. Okay, but what year? Yeah, that was too, well. Two thousand one is when I graduated high school, so oh, okay. it was like ninety seven, ninety eight. Oh, gotcha. All right, all right. So that was even like before yes. Columbine, probably, or in that around that time. That was right before Columbine. Yeah, that was right before that's, Columbine. That's what I was I wondering. So, so because I'm trying to connect some dots. So, what you guys know, I've shared this on the podcast before, but we just had a shooting at my kid's school in May, 2019. And so, uh, you know, I was really interested in some of your story, uh, just knowing, cause here's the thing as I haven't gone through it as a person whose kids were perfectly safe. Now they're going to have to deal with some things. Um, but they're fine physically. Um, it, it's really what it turns out to me. And this was surprising to even me, uh, cause I'm a fairly political guy and I, I enjoy back the back and forth of things. But the reality is n- most of what people try to insert into a situation like that is, has nothing to do with it. So people try to talk about, and I'll be honest, I think even mental health, but they talk about guns. They talk about, uh, like in this case, uh, one of the students is a transgender student. They'll talk about that. They'll talk about, d- um, you know, different kinds of how the system, all these things, none of that is really what matters. What matters is, the reality is there's there's two human beings who were hurt by some circumstances in their lives 
And they that brokenness spilled over onto a bunch of other people. Right. And so what I hear in your story is, is the same thing, not to make, they're not the same, but I'm not trying to equate them. I'm just, it's similar. The, is you were hurting, you were, you were hurting and your brokenness was just spilling over onto other people as you're trying to get what you need. So you spent that time in the facility. Did that help? Uh, It sort of (laughs) was like a coddling behavior to me because I had actually enjoyed being in there. Yeah. Um, there was no responsibility. I didn't have to work. I didn't have to go to school. Um, we just hung out all day. Um, and, and the whole thing was I was protected from the world. Uh, I was, I was, you know, shielded from the world. Um, I didn't have to be a part of it. We could just, all we were responsible for was just waking up and doing our daily routine. Yeah. And so that I, it didn't really help. Um, I mean, it was just a place to hang out. And I had even gotten out for one month and I told my father I wanted to go back. <laughs> wow. Because I had friends there. And um, so, yeah, it didn't really help aside from having a Bible with me. But okay, so you had a. And that's really when I woke up. So you had a Bible. How'd you get the Bible? My, my aunt, my aunt was um, my uncle and my aunt, they had given me a Bible a couple of months. And then, so as soon as I was told that I was going in there, I said, the first thing I grabbed was my Bible. Wow. And so they allowed me to take it in. with Wow. Okay. So you're sitting around reading the Bible. What was it about reading? What, was there certain scriptures or what was it that you were finding as you were reading it? Oh, I, I devoured it. I really, mm. I devoured the entire Torah, the first five books of Moses at first. I, I read from page one and I read all the way to the end of the book of Moses. And then I started in, in uh, Matthew and I, and I went all the way to um, John and uh, I just read it almost cover to cover. And then when I got out, I kept reading and read all the way up through Paul's letters. Wow. So I just kind of almost took it in just completely. Yeah. You were thirsty. Really got me. I was, I was, I was, parched and I was, I was beyond, I was just, I was really thirsty. I mean, I was hurting and I had realized that I had hurt other people. I realized that I had become somebody who was terrifying to people. Um, and that was scary, scary to me. Um, because I could see the contrast in the Bible, you know, love your enemy. Um, you know, do, do good to those who hate you and do not repay evil with evil. Just those principles alone yeah. in seeing the apostles die for, for, for the gospel and one who had died for his, God himself, who had died for his enemies. Um, you know, me looking for justice and crying out for justice. Um, that's what got me. And the fear of death and the fear of, you know, one day I'm going to die purposeless and meaningless not having purpose. Uh, that's really what, what, what got me when I was reading through the scriptures. Yeah. So how did you end up giving your life to Christ? It doesn't have to be like a specific moment, but how did you know, all right, I'm, I'm changing sides here. It was a slow process, you know, and even to this day, I still have questions about the Bible. I ask and ask questions about God and, so it's always going to be a process, but the, the moment where I had first prayed, um, just a month earlier after I had gotten out of this facility, um, you know, I was really praying, you know, like, if, you know, God, if you're real, if you're absolutely real, like, I want you to prove it to me, you know, like, like an atheist would, just give me evidence. Mm-hmm. Um and, you know, just change, change my mind, change my heart, change my life, change things around in my life. And uh, if you're real, do, do this. Um, not so much of, you know, give, give me a million dollars or move me to another state or that sort of thing. Just remove the pain from my heart. Remove, remove the pain, whatever had caused me to, to hurt other people. And do all these things to other people and make them afraid. Um, I just didn't want to be that person. I said, you know, if, if Christ is the one, then make me like him. Yeah. 
and slowly I started to, to see it. You did. So it started to happen. Yeah, it started to happen slowly. You know, things started happening at school and, and instead of being vindictive and hateful, I started to actually stop preaching. And so the, the wow. easiest way for me to, to counteract that was to say, you know, here, there's a thing called the Bible here. Why don't you read it? Um, and that really started, the, the, the conflict started to decrease. Um, I didn't have to worry too much about getting into too many conflicts anymore. Um, the only thing that I had to worry about was I was about to graduate high school in a couple of years. And I was in a school that was in a special school and I really didn't have a lot to stand on as far as going to college. So that was the only thing I had to worry about. Wow. But the conflicts with my family and my friends, they really started to decrease. Hmm. Yeah. Because Christ is getting into you, right? Slowly and surely. Yeah. Yeah. He's being real. Interesting. Okay. So uh, is college, this is just a kind of a random question, but is college out there? Like the bar would seem to be really high to me, right? If you with Harvard and MIT and all the Ivy League schools out there, I would think that the bar is like, well, I'm not going there. I might go to the community college or something. Uh, like yeah. that, that made sense yeah. in in Iowa where I grew up, but not. I would, I would, if I had a, such a high standard out there, I would I would be a little bit challenged to try for it. But so is there is that kind of a climate out there? Yeah, that's sort of like my father gave me the ultimatum. He's like in my last year of high school when I was about to graduate, he's like, hey, you know, and he w- and he was sort of well off at the time. He said that he would either send me to, and my brother was just born a couple years earlier. I actually have an 18-year-old brother, half-brother. Um, and he was going to send me to, to MIT, which I really wanted to go to. But my high school didn't supply any of the tools, like any of the yeah. – they didn't do SATs, any of that stuff. And so he says, do you want to go to college or do you want to work? And I says, I might as well work. Yeah. And I left and I came back here to Boston. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. So, all right. So you get out. So, and Christ is slowly working his way into your life here. So how does that t- take me to like, I, I know you said you had some struggles now, but take me to like, how did you know, or how did you realize that you were actually, believing and then because and then eventually you end up so so you get into this pentecostal kind of side side too right when i started going to church i mean at first i was just sort of a smart guy i was like pretending to listen i was sitting there sleeping pretending to sleep but once i really started in in some of the scriptures that really popped out to me was ezekiel one and that was just really interesting to me yeah, because I could. It, it was a description of God's glory, but I thought at first it was about aliens. You know, because <laughs> everybody so thinks that, right? Aliens, and I thought, it was, huh? I said everybody thinks sci-fi that sci-fi guy. Yeah, you know? yeah. At first, I mean, when you read it, it's like, what is this? But right. it's cool, you know. And so I'm like, all right, well, this is this is about God, but it's also about aliens. Cool. So I, I'm really starting to get peaked and, and interested, and I'm starting to listen to the sermons. And the guy that really sort of marked the example for me, a couple of people, but one of the guys that marked the example for me um, was a South African uh, preacher um, who who led the congregation of many Italian-speaking people and also African-speaking people, Arab people from Nigeria, which later on in life I ended up going to Nigeria on a mission trip through this church. Um, He was telling his testimony about being – a very vindictive, angry guy, a very racist guy in South Africa. Um, he was he was a a, a Dutchman in, in, in the apartheid time in South Africa, and he just told us the story of how he was an alcoholic. He used to hate um, all you know every black person that he saw, but once Christ came into his heart, he started noticing that hatred started slipping away. And I really related to that, and I says this thing must be real. Because it's happening in this guy too. Yeah, it happened for the him, for him. It could happen more for me. And I asked in prayer. I went up and I asked for prayer. And the first prayer request I ever had um, was my um, sound mind. I, I asked him for a sound mind. 
And when I got baptized, the first thing I said when I got out, I still have the baptism video. Um, I, I said, I was a crazy person and now I'm not. That was my testimony. Wow. That's so awesome. I was, I was, I was, I was yeah. <laughs> wow. That's great. So, around 18 years old. Yeah. That's fantastic. So I love that. I love that Jesus can um, reach even somebody who who was really had a, a – I mean, it sounds like you just had a really hard time as a kid um, and and prone to violence. And But he, he reached you and he changed you. That's what the gospel does. Yep. I love that. That's right. So how did you grow then? How like so you you take us into some of that? Did you have some people who invested in you, or was there like a certain passage or two that really really spoke to you? Just oh, give man. us a few examples. I, I could not if it wasn't for my disciples, if it wasn't for the people who were in my life. Um, you know, I've had a long ride with my family, you know, but they've always been there. Uh, but the disciples from the, the supportive community at this, at this church, uh, they really modeled it and they were in my life because my grandmother had allowed one of the youth pastors, um, in one of the properties that we owned on the second floor, him and his wife lived there and they had just graduated Bible college that I would later on go to. Um, he was really one of the people that really modeled it for me, and he was there. When I was running around, I was still not completely there yet. I was still running around in the streets, acting like a fool, still doing kid stuff, um, smoking marijuana, drinking, and things like that. I was believing, and the hatred was starting to dissipate, but the sanctification process was still a long way down the road. Um, I had, and he had told me about Teen Challenge, oh, yeah. which I later went to Teen Challenge for three years. Cool. So that's where I really started to grow. Did you, um, did you have any kind of like dark night of the soul after that or like kind of difficulties or feeling like God maybe oh, wasn't yeah. there? I, mean, I still, yeah, I mean, there were, there's always been moments of time, you know, because I've gone to Bible college and I, I flunked out of my first, uh, my first year, um, because I, I just, I wasn't prepared for it. Um, I wasn't ready. I went for the wrong reasons. Um, and I flunked out of that. I was still struggling with things like pornography. Um, I was still struggling with a lot of things. Um, I had gotten sober the year before I had stopped. I went to AA and I had a good support system of Christian brothers in, in that, in, in AA that we, you know, for a full year. And then I went on a mission trip. I had come back. I was still, um, dealing, struggling with, uh, issues with my family, but I had God with me. I knew that I had God with me. He was in my life and he was working things out. So I wasn't lashing out as much. Um, he was really chilling out my character. He was really working in and through me. So it really wasn't of me. It was by his grace and faith. Um, but Teen Challenge, that environment is really what matured me. I started to become a mature believer um, because they were really working that sanctification process into me in that program. I had no other choice. I was there. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay, cool. So take us – so did you end up going back to Bible school? Did you end up finishing that or – no, I, I no. felt that. I flunked out after a semester, and um, I had really struggled through that because I wasn't honest enough with people. Mm. I wasn't transparent with people. Uh, I wanted to become a pastor, but I wasn't spiritually mature. I didn't deal with my issues <laughs> uh, of prior. I said, okay, I'm sober. That That is the situation for everybody in Bible school. Let me, who wants to be a pastor? Let me tell you, <laughs> man, I did the same thing, but I... Uh, eventually it took me nine years to get a three year degree. So <laughs> it's, uh, wow. I get it. I get it. Uh, so anyway, what, um, it's not easy. no, it's not easy. Tell us what, where you went from there. So from, from teen challenge, um, I was in teen challenge for three years and the thing to coming back to some of the, the, the mental emotional stuff. Um, now I had been off of medication for many years. I, once I turned 18, 
um, I had gotten off of medication. And uh, I just, they didn't suggest it. They didn't tell me to. I said, I'm 18. I don't want to be on pills anymore. So I really started to lose it. Um, things, they got bad. They got bad. They got really, really bad. Even with Christ in my life, I still felt a lot of mental and emotional pressure in my mind. I started getting really paranoid. Um, I start, that's why I started getting into drugs and alcohol because I had to replace the medication with something. Um, and so I was still dealing with a lot of these things, even being a teen challenge because I had been off medication for probably a good five to 10 years at that point. Mm. Um, but I had never wanted to be on medication ever again. And I was, I had a heavy, heavy depression in the last year. The last year I fell into such a depression that I've never felt before. Wow. And a lot of guys do say that that happens in the program toward the end of it because they know they have to leave and go back home and they don't know where to go from there. Um, so, cause, cause you get used to it, you know, you kind of get institutionalized. It's a great, great program, but some people get institutionalized. Um, so I had fell into a thick, deep depression that I, I mean, I, I was, I knew I was never going to kill myself. I never knew I, you know, I never thought I was ever going to do that, but I felt it every day. Um, I really did. Um, but praying every morning with the guys, uh, waking up at 5 a.m., doing our ministry, that is what kept me strong. Um, and even remembering what I had done um, the years earlier with the incident uh, at school, that memory came back so clear and vivid. Mm. I don't know if it was a satanic influence. I don't know if it was just me being me. But the guilt of having had that incident, you know, it was just a voice that kept repeating, why would you ever do something? Why would you ever say that? Why would you ever? It was just this constant guilt. And I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't tell anybody, you know, because they would think I was crazy. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah, I, I can't tell people this. And so that's why I never up until now, never wanted to tell people this part of my testimony mm. because I had gone through so much uh, guilt over something that I didn't even do, something maybe I was planning, but something I didn't do. You know, it, it's, it's kind of a strange feeling to feel that much guilt for something that you might have done or could have done. But you, but God stopped me, you know, and yeah. I had to stop in my tracks and say, you know, God didn't allow me to do that. God stopped me before I could do that. He got into my life before I did that. I didn't hurt anybody. And I have to stop acting and beating myself up. And people kept telling me, put the bad away. You know, they kept saying that, put the bad away. Don't beat yourself up. Yeah. Um, now, if I did something that might be different, um, but God obviously intervened. Right. Right. And praise God for doing that. Right. I mean, that's, right. Amen. that's, that's, the, I don't know where I would be. Right. Now. Right. right. Wow. And it sounds like, like even, I just love this, you know, even your aunts that gave you a Bible, right. That, you know, to, to read, uh, when you were in the institution, like that's, that's powerful. You know, it's powerful. God uses it. Um, yeah. Wow, that's great. So, okay, thank you for sharing it. By the way, I just want to say that. Thank you for sharing this. I know that you have you haven't shared a lot, um, and uh, it is it is kind of scary to share those kind of things. And so, I appreciate your vulnerability. Um, and I think really uh, God is um, going to use that. And so, friends, if you're out there, like you need to trust Him, right? You need to trust Him and go follow Him where. Um, you know, where he's taking you. And even if you feel like you are having mental health issues, get help. It's okay. Even if you're uh, church people, you think they're not going to respect you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you're healthy and that's what God wants. The gospel is all about the restoration of all things, including your mind. And so that is Amen. super powerful and, and uh, because he is powerful. So, uh, okay, well, t take us up through, like, give us a quick overview up through today, and then we'll we'll uh, get going. 
I had become a very compassionate person after Teen Challenge. I had become a very um, well-balanced person um, mentally, emotionally after that experience. Um, I was in a, a tough relationship for five years. Um, I was in a relationship with a, a woman who had Tourette syndrome. Um, so that was a difficult situation. Um, she was not a very spiritual person. Um, I thought I would give it a shot. Um, and it didn't really end well. She had a lot of family issues and as well. And her brother tragically died in a car accident. That's how that ended. But the compassion in me really shone through, uh, the patience and the compassion, um, the ability to say, you know, I cannot judge people because look at where God has taken me from. Why should I judge other people? Um, because God can use anybody and God could do anything with anybody. And so who am I, you know? Um, and so that character that was built into me really shone through in that five years. Um, now I, I've been without her for two years and where I am now is, um, I had just come back from Israel a couple of months ago and I can tell you, I could have never, ever, ever back then ever imagined me doing such a thing as serving in Israel. I had served in Israel on the vineyards in Samaria, um, pruning grapes, and vineyards, cool. um, and going to all the sites and serving the people of Israel. Um, I could have never imagined that years ago in that institution. Never, 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 never. Right. Um, okay. I got to ask you some questions. So, because you, so you ended up in this sort of Pentecostal uh, strain, we'll say, but then, but you use words like Torah. And so like, if you don't want to go too far into this, that's okay. But, I, but not everybody does that. Right. So like, I want to know, tell, tell me, tell me about that. Cause it is interesting. It's, it's, uh, and you, you went to zero. So I want to know like more, tell me more about that and how God led you to, to that part of your faith. Uh, here's the gold. Here's the good part. Um, that's what led me up to Israel. Um, because when I was in that institution and I was reading through the Old Testament, as we call it, um, nobody had told me, don't do that. Don't do those laws. <laughs> nobody told me, don't celebrate Passover. Yeah. Nobody told me, don't, don't observe Sabbath. I just read it and I did it. Oh, um, wow. Now, I was in New Hampshire most of the time, and my mother was down here. I didn't have a lot of church background. Um, yeah. I only visited on the weekends. Now, I joined uh, – I didn't, I didn't exactly join full swing, but I found a Messianic synagogue in that same church building that my mother was going to. So sometimes I would go on the Sabbath up on the second floor to the Russian – Hebrew Messianic congregation. Oh, wow. And yeah, I would observe what they were doing. And that really got me because it was really practical. The things that they were talking about, it wasn't so, you know, ethereal, spiritual. It was very, very practical right. to me. And I needed practical. I needed practical. So I had always had a background there, and I had made my return to the Messianic community just a couple of years ago. Gotcha. Yeah, interesting. So I have a friend who's a who is I don't think he's Jewish, but he goes to a Messianic Jewish congregation, or he did when I knew him, and uh, he took me a couple of times. It was awesome. Like I, there's there's something about here's there's the one thing. Although there's I'm not about I'm I'm personally not about to go and uh, go to the Old Testament law a lot, but. What I am interested in is sometimes the ways of reading scripture are really, um, they make more sense than the Western ways that we tend to look at it. Because the Hebrew way of looking at scripture is very, very, um, it's different, but that doesn't really do it justice. It's much more earthy. It's much more connected um, to like the ways that words are used there. It's playful actually, which is kind of interesting. A lot of times yeah. there, there's, yeah. there's some, there's some irony and some humor to that, that, uh, we don't get in English at all. And so that, um, that makes me really 
think that, hey, there's probably something there's I need to do some more study. You don't get that in seminary when you're studying Hebrew typically, but yeah. uh, I think there's something there. So I, I love that. Absolutely. Uh, and and um, like I said, it, w- it was really, really practical to me and it was really touching when I found that because maybe I'm thinking that that I'm not saying this is true for everybody, but for me, that's probably what I was looking for all those years that I was um, a believer, but still sort of not quite there yet. Um, when I, when I was still hanging out with crowds that, you know, didn't reflect me and maybe that's what I was looking for. Maybe that's exactly what I needed. And maybe God knew that's exactly what I needed. Um, now I don't pressure other people to do the same thing. Um, but this is what God had convicted me to do. I, I eat kosher. I observe Sabbath as much as I can. Um, I'm not perfect at it, but I give it a shot and I do whatever I can through his faith and grace. Um, so I'm still very much a Christian. I don't identify as Jewish, but I do identify as being grafted into Israel. Um, and I'm still very, um, you know, and one more thing I got to throw in is that, you know, my, my mom had taught me and a lot, a lot of my family had taught me a lot about end times and watching out for the antichrist and the beast. And yeah, um, that's all fine and good. You know, it's part of the Bible and it's very interesting. But some people make a whole lifestyle out of trying to find out who the Antichrist and the Beast are. <laughs> and for me, the Messianic movement made it a daily process for me, not just waiting for the Antichrist and the Beast or waiting for the second, second coming. Um, so it's almost both, but it's more so a daily practice right. for me rather than that. Well, the, yeah, the early believers believed we were already in the last age, right? Which is... Would, yep. that's interesting. So there's, because God is doing something anyway, that's a whole nother thing. We, I've gone like 150 episodes without, uh, talking about, uh, in detail the end time. So that's good. So we're going <laughs> to, but it is a great, it is interesting. I know, it's very good. Yeah. Yeah. So Joe, we need to get going, but I want to thank you for being here. Uh, friends, you can find Joseph on, Facebook, I threw a link to that in uh, the show notes at halfwaytherepodcast.com. You can just connect with him. And I would encourage you to check out his show. Um, I made an appearance there uh, a little while ago now. And I always get the little notifications. You go live on Facebook. And so I'll watch a little bit here and there. And uh, it, it's good, always interesting. Your Certainly your intellect comes out and you talk about uh, all kinds of different issues and ideas. And I think that is great. So anything you want to leave us with Joseph? Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for having me on. Thank you. Anybody that, that is listening. Um, and I just wanted to say that, you know, anything that I had said, I, I absolutely empathize with anybody who has been hurt by violence. Um, I absolutely empathize. Um, my, my reason for wanting to release this part of my testimony is because I want to touch somebody who may be struggling with mental illness. I wanted to talk about that part of my life because I feel that it makes me more authentic. Um, I don't want to hide things from people anymore. I want to be able to show what God has done. And um, if at all possible, if anybody needs help, like Eric said, don't be ashamed to get help. Go get help. Yeah, that's right. Be sure to speak up if you're anywhere near uh, something like suicide or hurting other people or whatever it is. Uh, go find a trusted friend. Find somebody. If you don't have anybody, um, I, man, I don't know. There's there's hotlines, and I guess I'll find one to, to throw in uh, the show notes here for you as well um, because it, it does matter. And here's the thing. You matter. You matter to God. Jesus is proof. He sent Jesus for you, Uh, not just to save you from hell, but to save you right now. And that is it. Uh, The gospel is for today as well as the future. Uh, So, Joseph, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. And uh, I hope that that your story is one that people uh, resonate with and and, uh, can, can be encouraged by.